In this video, we're going to look at some exceptions to the octet rule. So we talked about the octet rule. It's basically the general rule that when forming bonds and molecules, atoms are going to want to fill their highest valence shell. Uh, and for most atoms, that means that they're going to want to have eight electrons surrounding it. Now, this is a very general rule. And with any general rule, there's bound to be exceptions. And the octet rule is no different. So I will say from the outset um, that three there are three atoms that you can count on to faithfully follow the octet rule in almost every scenario of a stable molecule. And those atoms are carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And this is very important that these three follow the octet rule. A lot of them are the, these three atoms form the basis for a lot of organic molecules, a lot of important uh, molecules for biological and technological applications. So these three atoms, uh, fa faithfully following the octet rule is, is nice. And that's the main reason why we teach it because it, it really allows a framework for us to understand the structure of a lot of important molecules that mostly center around these three atoms. However, these atoms are in no way representative of the entire periodic table, obviously, and not indicative of all molecules that exist. So obviously there are going to be some exceptions, but these three, the ex these exceptions fall into one of these three main categories. The first one is incomplete octets. And these are atoms that are perfectly fine with having less than a full valence shell expanded octets, which are atoms that can accommodate more than eight elect, uh, more than a full oct uh, octet. And the third category is odd electron molecules. And when I say odd, I mean odd number, right? So all of the examples that we've looked at thus far, it's been even numbers of valence electrons. You got eight or 10 or 16. But what happens when you have 15 valence electrons or 17, right? You, uh, you obviously can't partition them into paired bonds and lone pairs since it's an odd number of electrons. So this is another case where um, the octet rule is broken. So we're going to look at examples of each one of these cases in this video. And I want to start with incomplete octets. So incomplete octets are pretty common amongst, uh, you know, beryllium, boron, aluminum, right? A lot of these atoms that are further left on the periodic table, not very electronegative, um, these atoms tend to uh, tend to result in incomplete octets, especially when they're involved in bonds with really electronegative atoms. So let's look at some example an example here. Let's look at the BCL3 molecule. So for BCL3, let's look at its Lewis structure or let's build its Lewis structure. So first we want to ask ourselves how many valence electrons do we have in total in this molecule? Right. So we know that there are three chlorines and chlorine is going to have seven valence electrons. Right. So we have seven times three. Right. So this accounts for the three chlorines. And for boron, boron is going to have three valence electrons. So that's coming. That three is coming from the boron. Right. So you do seven times three, which is twenty one plus three is going to give you twenty four. So we have 24 valence electrons total. Okay, cool. So now we want to connect each of these atoms to each other, right? So we're going to form the bonds, right? So I'm going to put boron in the center here, and I'm going to have three chlorines attached to it, right? Okay. So, um, so we've attached all of the borons and chlorines to each other and we've accounted for six electrons here, right? So we still have 18 electrons that we need to account for. So one way we can do it, um, and especially considering the rules of electronegativity with lone pairs, we can give the lone pairs to these chlorine atoms, right? So right there. And then another six here. So we've just added six, 12, 18 electrons. So this gives us 24 electrons, but we have a boron atom at the center that does not have a full valence shell. It only has six electrons attached to it. Well, this is actually the complete Lewis structure for 
uh, boron trichloride for BCL3. And so with this, uh, with this incomplete octet, um, it is actually satisfied. Now, this isn't without consequence. Because it has an incomplete octet, BCL3 tends to be a very reactive molecule and will react readily with any, um, any molecule that has a readily available lone pair of electrons to give up to it. And so let's let's talk a little bit about why this is the case, because I know some of you might be thinking, wait a second, I can draw this Lewis structure in the following way. Right. So we can give lone pairs here, lone pairs here. And then let's say we double bond this boron to the chlorine. Right. And then give these last two lone pairs to the chlorine at the top. What we've done here is we have a, a structure where boron has a full octet, everybody has a full octet, everybody's happy, we've accounted for 24 valence electrons, we're good. Why is this not correct? Well, it's because of something called formal charges, and it's a topic that we'll discuss in a few videos from now, a few more lectures, uh, we'll talk about formal charges. But just to give you a general sense of what happens when you form this double bond, what you do is you create a partial negative charge at the boron atom and a partial positive charge at the chlorine atom. And this flies in the face of what we understand about electronegativity. Chlorine is one of the most electronegative atoms on a periodic table and boron is clearly not. And so creating this partial negative charge at boron is really unphysical with what we know about the way that molecules form. So, um, so that's why this would be an incorrect representation of boron trichloride. So when we introduce formal charges, I'll come back to this point and, um, and kind of explain further why that's the case. But this is a uh, unique and good example of an incomplete octet. And this is one of the main cases of exceptions to the octet rule. When you have these atoms that are perfectly fine with less than eight electrons around them. Okay, so let me go to a new slide and discuss expanded octets. So expanded octets are obviously the opposite of incomplete octets. These are atoms that are perfectly fine with having more than eight valence electrons around them. And these usually occur on a periodic table from period three on down. So period three and below is where you start to see these uh, expanded octets as exceptions to the octet rule. So that's the third row or below on the periodic table. You start to see this. Um, so let's look at an example of this. So the best example for this is SF6. So you've got one sulfur and six fluorines, right? Um, so again, let's construct the Lewis structure so that we can see what we're, what we're dealing with here. So of course we got to ask ourselves, how many valence electrons do we have here, right? So how many valence? We're going to have seven valence electrons for each fluorine. That's going to be seven times six, right? So this accounts for the six fluorines, right? Plus sulfur, which is going to have six valence electrons. Right. So six valence electrons for the sulfur. When you add all of this up, you get 48 valence electrons. Right. Because we've got the uh, 42 from seven times six plus the six from the sulfur gives us 48. OK, so now again, we want to form the bonds here. So form our bonds. Now, when we form these bonds. Right. You're going to have sulfur in the middle and you're going to have six fluorines around it. All right, so I'm gonna do three there and three there, right? So this is gonna be uh, the bonding framework for SF6, right? What you'll notice is, well, first we've accounted for um, for 10 valence, oh, for 12 valence electrons, right? Because we had six bonds, each one representing two electrons. So we've accounted for 12 of these valence electrons, but you'll notice that our octet for sulfur is already expanded, right? It's already overfilled. So we're gonna add the lone pairs to each of the fluorines, right? Remember that a, a valid Lewis structure requires both the dots and the dashes. So we gotta put these guys in there. So adding in these lone pairs, right? So now we've accounted for all 48 
valence electrons here in SF6. So sulfur is perfectly fine here, expanding its octet and uh, accommodating these extra electrons. Why is that? So let's go into the uh, the reasoning why. And it has to do with it being in period three or below. So sulfur is in period three, right? Um, if we think about the valence electron configuration for sulfur, right? So we've got um, 3s2 and we've got 3p4, right? So this is the 3s and this is the 3p. Well, because, and this is a little bit of an oversimplification, but the full explanation for why this is the case is a little bit outside of the scope of this class. But what you want to think about here is that since sulfur is in the third peer, the third uh, principal quantum level, it has access to the 3D orbitals, right? So you've got your 3D orbitals that are in this same principal quantum level. So because this 3D uh, quantum level, principal quantum level, is so close to the 3p, it can allow for sulfur to accommodate extra electrons from fluorine. So it's perfectly fine with sharing extra electrons with fluorine because it has access to this D level, right? Which doesn't occur in period two or above, right? At, this, at the second uh, period principal quantum level, there is no 2D orbital, right? So, um, so only once you get below period three, do we start to see this phenomena where we can have expanded octets because these atoms are comfortable with uh, with accommodating extra electrons since those d orbitals are nearby? OK, and the last uh, case here is odd electron molecules. All right, so we got odd electron molecules. Right. And this this happens in certain cases. You're not going to see it a lot in this course. You will see it some in um, when you get to organic chemistry with something called free radicals. And I'll talk a bit about what that is here in just a second. But let's look at NO2 as an example of this. Right. So, you know, the NO2 molecule, um, if we look at how many valence electrons we have here, right, how many valence Right, so for nitrogen, we're going to have five from the nitrogen. Plus, for oxygen, we're going to have six times two. Right, so this accounts for the two oxygens. So that's going to give us a total of 17 valence electrons. Right, so again, this is unlike any situation we've encountered before. Usually we have 48 valence electrons, eight valence electrons, 10, some even number. But here we have an odd number, 17 valence electrons, right? So, um, so let's start connecting uh, the Lewis structure. So let's form the bonds. So I'm going to have nitrogen in the center, going to have oxygen here, oxygen here, right? So um, we can fill the octets um, if we double bond to one of these oxygens, right? And go ahead and fill that guy's octet. Um, and then we can have the other one here just filled with lone pairs, right? But if we do this, right, we filled both octets, but we've only accounted for 16 valence electrons. We still have one more electron that's left, right? So what I'm going to do here is just put that one lone electron as a dot on the nitrogen. And this is what we call a radical. A radical electron is just going to be any electron that is unpaired. It's it's in a stable structure, but it is unpaired. And in fact, I, I shouldn't use the word stable here so loosely. Free radicals form uh, create very unstable and highly reactive molecules. So this NO2 molecule would be very reactive because nitrogen is still desperately seeking to fill its octet. Right. So any molecule that has this type of lone electron. Um, as a radical is going to be very reactive. It's going to be very, um, you know, unstable, wants to form a bond, wants to grab a lone pair of electrons, anything it can do to uh, to fill its octet. OK, so this is by no means an exhaustive list of all of the exceptions to the octet rule. But definitely for this course, 
most of the um the the exceptions to the octet rule that you will encounter should fall in one of these three categories either an incomplete octet expanded octet or an odd electron molecule 